Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. My name is Sam Liberty. Hope you're having a great GDC. So uh, today I'm really excited to be presenting to you on the topic of escape rooms and specifically uh, why escape rooms are so great for teaching game design basics to new students. Uh, so uh, first, a little bit about me. I am a professor at Northeastern University where I teach fundamentals of game design and other classes. Uh, additionally, I am a consultant in my normal work where I do games for impact, also known as serious games. Uh, you can see some of my clients here uh, over at Extra Ludic. Uh, you'll see that there are a lot of large NGOs, governments, uh, and academic institutions. But I want to draw uh, your attention to some work that I did with DARPA uh, because I actually designed an escape room for DARPA uh, on a DARPA grant along with some of my Northeastern colleagues. So what I designed is an escape room called Daedalus. Uh, it was an alternate reality game and the escape room. Uh, it was played online over Slack. Uh, and the purpose of this escape room was to test people's adaptability in teams in unpredictable and uncertain work environments. So we had to design some very specific puzzles uh, that satisfied those requirements. Uh, and we were able to not only show that that worked, but that you can actually test uh, an experiment in a controlled way with an online game or an ARG uh, compared to having to do it in a, in a lab setting or to have enumerators follow around people uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so that was my, uh, my big escape room contribution. Uh, but over at Northeastern, I teach uh, fundamentals of game design. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, this is usually a class of around 20 students. They're new game design students. And pretty much every game design student that comes through Northeastern has to go through this class. And not only have I taught it and will teach it again, uh, but I actually designed the syllabus for this class along with some of my colleagues, and I made sure to include an escape room in uh, one of the early units for reasons that will become clear soon. So in this image, you can see some of my students working on their escape room prototype. Uh, they're actually playing through it, and uh, they're in a situation where they're supposed to be on opposite sides of a prison cell uh, working in parallel to escape. Uh, so what will we be talking about today? Uh, first, I'm going to be talking about why escape rooms make uh, such good game design uh, lessons. So we're going to go over the features of an escape room that make it good for teaching game design basics. Uh, and we're also going to go over the individual skills that students get to drill and hopefully master when they design their own escape room in a team. After that, I'm going to tell you exactly how I did it. Uh, and how, how we do it over at Northeastern, uh, including the phases of design, uh, the skills that uh, students get to drill, uh, the deliverables that we expect them to, to bring uh, for their grade, and how they reflect at the end of the process to crystallize their learning. So why escape rooms? What makes these so good at teaching game design and making people into better game designers. So the first feature I want to call attention to is the fact that they are analog. And by analog, I mean they're not digital. They're not video games. This makes them exceptionally easy to rapidly iterate. Uh, you are basically just taking pieces of paper, cardboard, whatever, and moving them around and rewriting them and, and things like that. Uh, you don't have to go into a terminal. You don't have to go into Unity. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty great for building things fast. Um, there's also no coding required, which means that you don't need any special skills to do this. All you need is kind of a desire to be a game designer uh, and everything that you need to know to make these, we actually teach in the class. So it's very uh, egalitarian that way in terms of what skills are required and the kinds of people that can make them. Uh, so the next feature I wanna talk about is how highly thematic an escape room is, at least hopefully. So when you go to an escape room, why are you going there instead of just doing puzzles at home like a Sudoku or a crossword uh, or even something more complicated? Uh, and the reason that I think people gravitate towards these games is that they are very immersive. Uh, when you're in an escape room, you're really in a 360 uh, immersive world. 
that the designers uh, took great care to make you feel like you were in that place. And of course, there's some suspension of disbelief. You know, some things aren't necessarily uh, real, uh, but uh, it, it feels like you're there. So if you're building an escape room that supposedly uh, has you in a hospital infested with zombies and you have to escape, uh, you really want the players to feel that way. And since my students don't have a huge fabrication budget, you know, they don't have a big special effects budget. They're not uh, incredible engineers or set designers. Um, that immersion is going to come through their game design, through their puzzle design uh, itself. Uh, so this is very good practice for uniting theme and mechanic. Uh, and these can be top down or bottom up, by which I mean, you can have either have a theme that you really want to deliver, uh, like the zombie hospital or whatever, uh, or you can have a, a mechanic or a collection of mechanics that you think would make a good puzzle or escape room, and then build a theme around that. Uh, and in fact, that first image that I showed you of the people in the jail cells was a bottom up design where they wanted just to split people up and have them working on parallel puzzles. Uh, so they came up with the prison theme as a wrapper for that. And on the right, you can see a puzzle that some of my other students made where they were doing a mafia bar themed escape room that had a supernatural twist to it. Uh, so they made this kind of neat uh, drink menu puzzle. Uh, and there's lots of stuff like that that my students end up making. Uh, so additionally, uh, escape rooms are multiplayer and it's good to be able to learn to design multiplayer games. You have to design them for teams, uh, and that means different people moving different ways in unpredictable manners. Uh, it also means multiple player psychographics. So you're building an escape room that appeals not just to you or not just to a certain type of person, but to varied people on a team uh, that can be large. So you might have some puzzles that are for people that like physical assembly and, and spatial puzzles. You might have different puzzles that are ciphers. Um, puzzles that are logic puzzles. There's lots of different things that you can do and my students do. Uh, and it requires um, a little bit more work and a little bit more thought to appeal to a large team like that. Escape rooms feature many interlocking subsystems. All these different puzzles need to be happening either linearly or in parallel, usually a combination of the two. They're all different, but they all have to be united under the umbrella of the escape room itself. Um, so it's a really a challenge to unite all those moving parts and make it feel coherent and immersive. Uh, this opens up an abundance of design space. Uh, there's lots of little nooks and crannies and things to make. Uh, and that makes it ideal for a small team of dedicated designers. Um, so by that I mean, again, uh, it's not a video game where you have a coder a producer, uh, an art director, an animator, a UI UX person, a sound person. No, you have four or five game designers. Uh, it is a game design class and it's the early one and we don't expect people to have uh, even programming skills, even though there are a lot of uh, computer science students in the class. Um, but uh, what you have is a group of four or five game designers. They can all design puzzle ideas. They can all build them. They can all test them. Uh, so this is really perfect for that. And, uh, each can kind of master or become the master of one aspect of the escape room. Uh, but, and then they work together to unite it. Uh, escape rooms have obvious balancing heuristics. And by that, I don't mean that it's easy to balance an escape room. The opposite, in fact, is quite challenging. Um, but what I mean is when an escape room is not balanced, it's pretty obvious why it's not balanced or where the imbalance is coming from. Uh, so there's things that you can easily look at. For instance, how difficult are the puzzles? Uh, what are your playtesters saying to you about them? Um, the time. You know, it's a 30-minute escape room. Are your players finishing it in 10? That is a problem. Are they finishing it never? Uh, that's a problem as well. Uh, is there one puzzle that's taking 20 minutes and then they're trying to cram the rest of it in the last 10? That's probably not the flow you want. You'll be able to see that. And then there's the legibility or uh, UX of it. And the how I think of UX in an escape room is a little bit different than how I think about it in, in a video game. But basically, I'm talking about the components, how they're made, how they're designed, and how they're laid out. Uh, 
the flow of the puzzles, the flow of the room, so that when you begin the timer and people are in the, in the escape room, uh, they know what to do. They can start attacking the puzzles and figuring out how to solve them. Uh, and if they can't, again, it's obvious that they can't, uh, and maybe painful to the game designer to watch that, uh, and they can start working on a solution. Uh, I'm sure there are many other features of escape rooms that make them really good for teaching these kinds of things. If you can think of them, go ahead and put them in the comments. Uh, I'd love to see them. Maybe we can talk about them as we go on. Um, but now I want to talk about the skills that your students are going to need in order to, uh, in order to make these escape rooms. So the first one is brainstorming. Uh, and there's kind of a misconception around brainstorming that it's uh, just something that you do. Uh, you get your team together and you just talk and that's a brainstorm. Uh, and to an extent, that's kind of true, but really brainstorming is a skill like any other that you can build and learn uh, and improve upon. There are specific techniques uh, and times to use them. Uh, and we talked about them earlier in the unit, so they kind of know about them. Uh, but this is a chance for us to actually do them. And we do three of them all in one day uh, to really drill that skill. So the first one is for the whole class. And I use a technique called SNAP. Uh, that I'll go into in a lot more detail later on in this presentation. Um, the second is a small group brainstorm once they have their teams where they build a consensus. And the third is an individual brainstorm where they're coming up with puzzles in kind of a rapid way. And again, I'm going to talk about all of these a little further along when I do the, the how section. Um, after the brainstorm is complete, uh, the next skill that we're going to be drilling is rapid iteration, uh, rapid prototyping. So to complete your escape room in time uh, and have it be satisfactory, you really need to be building puzzles pretty quick. Uh, it's not a long unit, and most of the unit is not devoted to your iterations. Um, so you're going to build them quickly, get them from your mind to the page, and get people playing them. Uh, you test them multiple times. Um, usually they're not going to work right out of the gate, so they need to be tested over and over again to get them perfect. Uh, and of course, physical puzzles, like I said before, are very easy to rapidly iterate. Even in the middle of a game, you can stop the time during a test, go in, change one of the numbers, uh, tell them something that they should be seeing that they're not, uh, or whatever, and then make that change for the next time. Uh, going right into that, play testing, uh, which is a little bit different than iterating, uh, cause you have to test it every iteration, um, and I want to call attention to a few things about how we play test these escape rooms. One uh, is they will be working both inside and out of class. So the first play tests they do are going to be kind of structured and observed by me, and I'm there to help them out. Uh, but then after that, they're going to be doing them outside of the class, and they're going to get that experience uh, recruiting. Uh, they're going to get that experience uh, organizing and running, making sure they go well. Um, the final deliverable that they're going to give, and I'll, I'll go into more detail in the second half, is actually a game test, right? Uh, you're not delivering a final finished escape room. That's not reasonable uh, for students. What you're delivering is a prototype that you will test live in class. And that really centers prototyping uh, and testing in this unit as a deliverable, uh, which um, kind of forefronts it in their experience. Uh, and last thing I want to talk about playtesting is that an escape room has major fabrication tasks. You're going to be going out, you're going to be buying props like the ones you see on the right. Uh, you're going to be spending your own money on that. Uh, you're going to be taking time, probably collectively hours with your team, uh, building, cutting, assembling, um, designing these props and components, uh, and kind of conceptualizing how they're going to fit in the room. And when you're doing all that, uh, it really behooves you to know that the puzzles that you put that you've put into place will actually work, and the only way you know they work is by playtesting them well beforehand. You don't want to be spending a lot of time and money and effort on something that will blow up as soon as you put it in front of someone. You want to know that it already works before you did all that work, uh, and that's something that they carry forward in their kind of student careers and hopefully as professionals, um, that playtesting is so important. And uh, with a video game, just like with this escape room, 
Uh, you want to make sure that your mechanics are going to work before you make your program or actually build them out. Uh, except, again, with an escape room, you don't need to code to learn that. So uh, the last skill I want to talk about is fine tuning, which might seem like it goes along with iterating and testing, and it does. But uh, what I am talking about is slightly different. So uh, early on in this uh, experience, you're going to be making kind of sweeping changes to your escape room, uh, conceptually, organizationally, uh, logistically, uh, or making large changes to puzzles, maybe even throwing puzzles out. Um, those are kind of large changes. By the end, you're going to be focused on these fine tuning things. Uh, and puzzle design is very granular. So a very small change can have a big impact on uh, the experience of the players. A very small thing can ruin the whole experience. Uh, so you're going to be balancing to the clock. Uh, it's a 30 minute escape room that you're designing. And ideally you want people finishing near the end or being almost finished at the end. So you have that 30 minute plus or minus two or three minute window. Uh, and it's a challenge to get people consistently landing in that window. And that requires fine tuning, uh, fine tuning of the components, fine tuning of the puzzles and fine tuning of a hint system which of course you'll need to develop um, because no matter how good your design is, people will get stuck uh, and uh, they'll need some sort of hint system. So is that going to be a resource-based hint system, time-based, freebies? It's really up to the students. And uh, another thing that I found is that the iterations on these components can really take students over the finish line and making it clear and fun to players, but can also kneecap a good design. So you see on the right, that's a puzzle that some students did. It was a jigsaw style puzzle. Uh, where they had to find and assemble these pieces and then get a code off of it. But as you can see, the components are very flimsy. They're small pieces of paper. Um, and they uh, turned out could be easily lost. And in fact, that bottom right-hand piece did get lost. Uh, luckily, the students were still able to play through because although who knows what that last digit was, a one, a six, a four, um, but they could just try them all. Uh, but that was not the experience that my students wanted when they designed this escape room. Uh, so uh, if they were a little more thoughtful about their component design, they wouldn't have had that problem. Okay, so um, how to teach with escape rooms. Uh, I'm going to show you exactly how I did it so you can adapt it to your own need. Uh, and you might have more or fewer students than me. They might be older or younger, more or less experienced. So this isn't one size fits all. Uh, but I encourage you to take this and kind of iterate with it. So here is the unit overview. Uh, it's a three-week unit. The first week is devoted to research and brainstorming, so kind of ideating our escape rooms. The second week is about prototyping and iteration, so building and testing it out. And then the third week is going to be the deliverable week, where we're going to actually live play test that final escape room for each team and uh, do our postmortem. Uh, so the first thing we do is field research. Uh, students can visit any local escape room they want. I usually point them towards Escape the Room Boston uh, because they have good production values and do a good job. Uh, but uh, they all have to go. They do it on their own time. It's not an organized field trip. Uh, they have to organize themselves and go. And then they write an experience report. Uh, so everyone is kind of on the same page. And we do this because not everyone has been to an escape room, right? Uh, and if you're going to design one, it's important that you have played at least one. Uh, so they go out and do this uh, to build their base experience. From there, we go to brainstorming. And again, I use this technique called Snap. That's been very valuable to me as my in my role as a designer for Games for Impact. Uh, and it's called Snap because it's based on a card game popular in the UK, similar to War, where you flip over cards and when they match, somebody says Snap. And whoever says it first gets to take those cards as a point. So this technique is really ideal for having a large group of people with a lot of different experiences and ideas and synthesizing one view of how to move forward. Um, so how it works is a student, uh, each student writes out post-it notes. We don't use playing cards like in the game snap. We create post-its. So I might ask, what are the mechanics that are that you want to have in an escape room and what are the themes that you want in an escape room and they'll write three or four post-its for each one of those. Uh, so 
Uh, just so you know, what we're looking at now is from a snout brainstorm, although it was not from an escape room. It was from a different class that I taught at Northeastern. Um, but we did use snap. We used a digital board called Miro um, because we couldn't meet in person because of the pandemic. However, normally we do meet in person and we do use a whiteboard uh, and a whiteboard marker and real physical post-its. And it does work better that way. So uh, someone will come up after they have their cards and present their first one. So someone might say, I want to make a horror themed escape room and they'll put it on the wall. Uh, and then anyone that has something similar or the same gets to say snap and they come up and they say, Hey, I have a haunted house. They stick it up there. Uh, and the closer it is uh, conceptually, the more those post-its overlap. Uh, and then if somebody has something that snaps to either one of those, they say snap and they go up and then you can snap to any of those three and you keep going until no one can snap to any of the post-its in the cluster uh, and then you move on to the next one. Hey, I want to make one based on uh, cute animals. Snap, I have cats. Uh, and over the course of this, uh, thematic clusters form. Uh, and then once everyone's cards are on the wall, we form these clusters. You might move them around a little bit to make sure it makes sense. Uh, it also takes some of the pressure off being perfect in the beginning because you can move them around. And then we name those thematic clusters. Uh, after that, there's a uh, kind of consensus uh, phase where they get to put stars on the clusters that jump out as being relevant. So I might ask prompting questions like, what are you excited to work on? Uh, and uh, what would be unique in terms of an escape room that hasn't been done a lot before? Or what do you think is feasible to do in three weeks? And then those stars go up based on that. And where those stars clump uh, is usually a good direction for the students to move. Uh, so after that, we do a group formation based on those clusters, and we have small group brainstorms. They can use any technique that we've gone over in class or any other technique, but these small group brainstorms are really just about building consensus, uh, so you know thematically and mechanically what you're making and how you're going to utilize the room, because the classroom does become the escape room. Uh, and then after you have that, we do a puzzle brainstorm. So how that works is uh, we break up and individually come up with puzzle ideas. And the reason we switch to individual at this point is because it's just so much more efficient. So if you have a team coming up with a puzzle brainstorm, you might have four or five people working together over half an hour and they get one really cool puzzle idea that's well fleshed out. And that's a nice thing to have. Uh, but if you have four or five people brainstorming puzzles individually, uh, coming up with a couple, instead of having one, you have like maybe 10 or 12, which is important because an escape room has a lot of puzzles in it. Uh, so, uh, they also start kind of writing out how the puzzle works and they can then present it to their team who don't know the puzzle and see if they can, uh, understand it and start solving it and if it's exciting to them. So you get an, an immediate proof of concept play test right at the end of the brainstorm, uh, which is a nice thing to have. Uh, so that kind of puts us right into rapid prototyping. So, we have our puzzle design. We start doing some paper prototyping of that. By that, I don't mean necessarily that they must be made of paper, just that they're lo-fi and easy to iterate. Um, so it could be something digital, like the one on the left, which is a presentation. Um, it was done in PowerPoint, and you go through steps. Uh, or it could be paper. It could be glass. Uh, it could be really anything that doesn't take that much effort to do. Um, but we start building those quickly and testing. Uh, but who tests it? Uh, that's an important question because eventually you're going to need a fresh team that has never done your puzzles before to play your final uh, final prototype. Because if they've seen your puzzles before, they can kind of fake their way through the escape room and it's not a good test. So what we do is we match teams up with a partner team. So those green lines, team one will play team two's puzzles and team two will play team one's and, and vice versa. Uh, and if you need a fresh look later on, you might go diagonally. So team one might help team four. Uh, but that means that the teams that are connected with blue lines have never played their escape room puzzles at all. And they're fresh and they will be the team that will play test your final prototype when you do the live testing class. So team one and team three, team two and two four and team four. Um, you're play testing inside class in that structure way that I talked about before. But then you're also playtesting outside of class. And the reason that we playtest outside of class is A, because there's just not enough time. We have only a couple classes devoted to building and testing. Each class is an hour and 40 minutes. 
and four hours is not enough time to play test and develop an escape room. So you need to do work outside of class. Um, this also gives each student the opportunity to actually organize and run their own play test instead of just having the team leader or whoever running play tests all the time. And that's an important skill for players to, for students to, to build. Then after that, you're going to fabricate and make something that looks a little bit nicer, something like uh, the props on the right that are kind of not, you know, super polished, but are funny uh, and, and fun and can immerse your, uh, your team in their escape room. Uh, and that can be a quite a major project, uh, like I talked about before. So uh, now today's the day, the day that you're going to do the live play test. And this happens in class, during class time. Um, and it runs the entire escape room with your fresh team under a timer. And like I said, that timer is 30 minutes. Um, now there's a question of space uh, because you have four teams and each team needs to play for half an hour and that's two hours and that's longer than, uh, than a class. So I usually reserve a separate classroom and I put two of the teams in that. Uh, and then that gives you an hour for escape room play. And then each escape room has 10 minutes of setup before, 10 minutes of breakdown and feedback gathering after, which is just about perfect, although it is still tight. So because it's still tight, um, it's really important that you make sure your students have all their prep done before class starts. You don't want them showing up, cutting, pasting, marking, coloring, um, printing, uh, because then they won't have enough time to set up and it'll cut into the other team's time and that is not fair. So stress that they need to have it all done and ready either the night before or the morning before, not in class. Uh, and to make sure that they not only leave time at the end to gather feedback from their playtesters, but have an organized way to gather that playtest feedback. Uh, and the reason that that is so important uh, is because it will feed directly into the reflections that they do, the postmortems that they do. So you're going to need an organized way to get good quotes and good insights from your players, not just stand up there at the end and say, well, what did you think? Um, and I'm sure if you said that, people would talk, uh, but you want to get good specific questions about your puzzles uh, in addition to your own observations. Uh, so it's actually important that one student takes notes uh, during this as well. Uh, so, okay, the reflection. Um, the final, final deliverable uh, is this postmortem reflection. So this is probably the first postmortem that my students uh, write in their game design careers. It's not something that high schoolers typically do. Um, so uh, it's important to, for them to understand what a postmortem is and why they're written. So uh, I assign them to read three postmortems for favorite games. Uh, they're easy to find online. You can Google them. Plenty of them are up on Gama Sutra, as, as you all know. Uh, and uh, they can really get a sense of the form of them and the content of them. Uh, so once they do that, we have them write a group postmortem on their escape rooms. So we want to hear what went right, what went wrong, and what they would do differently in the future. Uh, so this is essentially an honest evaluation of their work um, and uh, crystallizes what they learned in their experience so that they can continue carrying it forward in, in their academic and professional careers. Uh, because if they don't take the time to reflect, um, a lot of that learning can get lost. Uh, and equally as important uh, is, for me as the professor, I get to see them work through in written language their experience so I know what they struggled with. I know how they're thinking about their next room. Basically, they're conceptualizing their next prototype, uh, their next iteration in that document for me to see. Uh, and that's really, really helpful for me to grade them. Uh, so that is it. That's how, uh, how and why. I'm sure you're really excited to do it yourself. Uh, if you have questions uh, that you have not already asked in the comments below, feel free to reach out to me. I'll try to answer them. You can reach me about this or anything else at my Northeastern email address, which is there on the last slide. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter where I sometimes talk about game design uh, and Medium where I write about my design process uh, and uh, approaches. So I uh, hope to see you and I hope that you have uh, a great remainder of your CDC. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.